Okay. All right, good evening, everyone. So today I have Max Cole with me, and I'm really glad to have Max. Max is someone who has attained financial freedom uh, before the age of 30, and he makes his first million, uh, I think, at age 30, 29. So I think that's not a very easy thing to do. So Max, if you don't mind you know, for the audience, just share a bit more about you know your journey and how do you came to where you are today. Okay, uh, I think, first of all, I'm uh, <laughs> really not that cool. Uh, and yeah, I think just so that the people watching this can understand, this is really uh, <laughs> really zero preparation. So uh, let's just keep it a bit more spontaneous. Yeah, so I think, in a, without going into the long run other details, it's just a one-minute condensed journey. Um, I started out as a very typical 9 to 5 employee. Uh, background, zero background in investing. I never ever thought I would be doing investing today. So uh, my background comes more from like digital marketing, speaking, training. So uh, I think three things when I was younger, I was very inspired by the Adam Crew, Tony Robbins of the world. So I've always wanted right. to be a speaker, be a trainer. Uh, quite frankly, it's a bit of uh, egoistic reason. So you, I just love the crowd. I just love entertaining, speaking on stage, having that feel-good factor that, hey, you've made a difference or that change in someone else's life. So that was my dream. And I was very fortunate to find great mentors who actually took me under their wing. Uh, it's a digital marketing company in Singapore. So we do like seminars, trainings uh, around digital marketing, e-commerce, and they gave me the platform. So uh, that was really my nine to five job uh, that I did. So as a trainer, as a speaker, even though as a tight in title in the company, I was a general manager but uh, a lot of the job scopes also involve speaking and training and so from there of course uh, because of the nature of the job you speak one to many uh, right. you earn a decent amount of income and also a certain amount of like additional commissions or I would say additional incentives when you speak one to many because there's scalability in the job uh, so yeah that gave me my big base of capital which then led me on to the second part uh, which is to learn how to grow the money so in my early days uh, I never ever thought investing would be my cup of tea because I've always loved, uh, maybe not as good as you, I've always loved playing poker when I was younger as well. So um, I, I, I like the more fast-paced kind of stuff. So I did a lot of stuff when I was younger, Forex trading, futures, commodities, all the kind of price price action. Oh, wow, things. so you tried like different stuff before last yeah. time? Yeah, that was actually how I started. So most people, maybe they start like fundamental, then they go and learn TA. For me, I'm like, no, like, this fundamental thing wastes time so slow. <laughs> okay, right, oh, okay, I mean, okay. That's you just never think about compounding. Yeah, I think it's the first time you probably know this as well, right? So yeah, I did a lot of TA, a lot of price actions, learned all the different doji patterns. Or whatever, right, right. I forgot already today. Okay. Uh, and so, then from there, I realized I trade in, trade out. Some days you make like maybe one, two K a day. It seems very exciting. Like, yay. But then some days you realize you're losing money. So like trade here, trade there. And it's like, I, I trade back then, I recall like the one hour time frame and stuff because it's right. more exciting. Ma. So was there a part where, you know, your mindset start to shift and what got you really into like, I mean, not that you weren't aware yeah. that's investing, like you yeah. know, Warren Buffett or that, but how did yeah. you, so what, what, what got you there eventually? Yeah, right exactly. So it's like you trade in, trade out on the shorter term time frame. You realize yeah. that ooh, I trade, I trade there some days, I make some days I don't make, but I spend so much time. And then I just like break even after like months or sometimes even slight loss. Then I realized that when I start thinking to myself, hey, Look at all these like richest people around the world. They're either investors or businessmen, right? They own something. Very true. And I also realized that if I want to actually get rich, I need to be able to put in a big amount of capital into whatever I want to invest, right? So, but I will not dare to do it if I'm doing trading because the thing can just swing and hit my stop loss and I'm out, right? So if my positions are so small, I can make short-term income, but I cannot make wealth. And the goal for me was I wanted wealth. I wanted to be to be rich like, <laughs> in a very money phase, man. <laughs> so right. uh, that was how I started. Okay, you know what? Everyone, this, yeah. this trading thing doesn't work. Let me go learn how to invest. And then from there, went on the rabbit hole, met a lot of great mentors, uh, people like you, and of course, a lot of people who are very, very amazing, very experienced, learned from many different sources, Motley Fool, Singaporean local mentors, investors, just read a lot of fund manager letters, became very nerdy about it. And then I think from there, I was very lucky, but good base capital uh, plus proper investing uh, that long across my first million at the age of 29. So yeah, that's a, sorry, it took more than one minute, but yes, that's a, <laughs> Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks, Max, for sharing. So, uh, what would you say is like your investing style or philosophy or principles nowadays? Is there any, you know, like uh, key guiding principles that you, uh, uh, you know, go, go for or like yeah. that guides you? Yeah. So, I think uh, quite frankly, it's still evolving. And I think it will evolve years from now or maybe even months Early. from now. Yeah. Right? And I think this period of drawdowns, everyone's style is evolving because there's so much time for reflection and yeah. for like, inward looking into yourself and your styles. Uh, so I think for myself as of now, I'm still a very, very fundamental based investor. Uh, even though I started from the technical side, I actually don't look at any charts these days. Uh, in fact, probably very rarely, even though I think there's actually a lot of benefits to TA. 
because if you combine and done properly, there can be a lot of congruence you can find, uh, but or confluence, I think that's what they call it, but I don't have time for that. So uh, for me, it's very fundamental. So I think two things, I focus a lot on growth companies, which I know, Ray Ming, yourself, you do that. Uh, so a lot of companies that are basically the high growth ones can be random industries. Uh, for me, I'm more in the consumer tech industry. Uh, I'm starting to do a slight shift, we can, we can talk more about it later, but uh, my wealth and my background or how I was able to get my first pot of gold was purely through consumer tech. A lot of e-commerce companies to be specific. Uh, so growth companies, consumer tech companies, and I will really study the metrics. So example, whether it's your revenue, your profit margins, your cash flow, and the typical customer metrics that's different for each industry, lah, right? Can be gross merchandise right, there, right. can be for the sales companies is the is the retention rate, for example. Right. So yeah, those metrics I pay very close attention. I will track quarter to quarter. Uh, and then from there I make decisions based on the fundamentals. Yeah. Nice. So I think it makes sense, right? Like I think at the start it's taking close to your circle of competency, yeah. going to, you know, getting your feedback with companies that or, or industries that you know you're familiar with, how they operate and all that, and, and then slowly, you know, uh export as you know, going yeah. further your horizons. So, you know, along the way, you know, this uh, journey I mentioned is very interesting. Uh especially this year, right, with the market drop. You know, how are you Oh, the market drop really? Huh? Like, like this. <laughs> <laughs> just joking. Yeah, okay. man. This year is like only one for the history books. You know, like yeah. look back on it, like two hundred eight. How uh, how do you uh, are you affected? Like, or if you don't mind sharing candidly, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Wow, like the end of the World War Three scenario kind. How are you dealing with this market crash and recession? Yeah. yeah. So I think I'll just split it into like three phases, right? Yeah. Which um, it's quite interesting because. Uh, I've also done a few podcasts with different investing uh, podcasters uh, across the months uh, in January yeah. and then in March. And you realize every time the lesson is different because as the time <laughs> progresses, the lesson confirmed will be different. Uh. So when it first started out, you know the crash, when I mean the drawdown when it first started, it's like last year around November, December, around that yeah. period, right? The yeah. multiple yeah. started. Yeah. yeah. So what happens is at first you're like, okay, this is just going to be another one of those. So it's just going to be done in like maybe three months, six months at, at, at most. Okay, right? I won't take that long. I'm sure that was how all of us. So that phase was like, it was still quite zen. I mean, in fact, you still actually talk about, you know what, stay calm and everything. And then of course, when the Russian thing started, which is the Russian-Ukraine war, because yeah. that one is really unexpected. Uh, and of course, a few other more, um, I would say more hawkish moves uh, by Jerome Powell. <laughs> Right. Then, of course, that you saw the multiple string further, like who knew, like, you know, you can contract and contract even more. Yeah. So, that really started to make me feel a bit like, okay, I was a bit shaken really here and there. Uh, and then after that, I think now the current phase is that you're just like numb, man. You're just numb <laughs> throughout. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh... Yeah, whether it's the same, you know, you know like there's this thing I think I learned in school psychology class is like the five stages of of grief you know? yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah, meant to say this to kind of talk about like death or whatever but it's like five stages of grief like you know delusion then you slowly go to acceptance uh, it's the same thing la. so um, yeah but I think for me to kind of maybe talk a little bit about that mm. I am still very lucky which is a lesson that I've learned which we can dig more into that if you want to I realized that I'm still able to stay quite calm because of one thing it's actually nothing to do with my stocks or my investor psychology, whatever, which is worse right. than the different around. It's actually because every month I still got decent cash flow coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. from whether it's my my, my side hustles, my part-time job, or my just my active income streams, uh, yes. that's still very, very comfortable. It gives me excess cash to still buy stocks. So right. I think even though yes, you see your NLV or interactive brokers go down, everything is ne never a nice feeling. But at least you know that you don't have to liquidate stocks and do these kinds of moves where you need to sell stocks at the lowest, which is never a nice feeling. Yeah. So uh, one lesson I, I think I can share that I draw line, at least as of now, uh, I'm still quite cool with it, even though I've went through the, the highs and lows of the delusion acceptance cycle. It's because I realized that actually a lot of people investing, I think a lot of investors, you know, you go onto Twitter, you go onto Motley Fool, you go onto like maybe even your Telegram group, or whatever, like articles online. Everyone's be talking about be patient, think long term. So you're trying to solve an investing problem with an investing antidote, right? Oh, think long term, you know, uh, monster, uh, monster beverage, you know? <laughs> all these kinds of examples, Amazon. But I realized that actually maybe you need to look at it from a non-investing lens, which is you've got to understand maybe the way to have holding power in this period, other than just, oh, think long-term because Buffett says think long-term, whatever, is to realize that you better go work on your active income streams uh, to boost it up. Because if that allows you to have very big cash flow and access to buy stocks, it, at least you come in with a very strong psychology and you still have access to buy stocks. 
So, and you don't have to worry about selling. So that's at least how I deal with it and I cope with this in this period. And thankfully, it's been, uh, fortunately, I think by God's blessing or what have you, it's, uh, my cash flow has been pretty, pretty uh, comfortable. Uh, and so because of that, uh, I'm still relatively okay. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's a good one, man. Uh, definitely, we I need to do a you know second interview with you to on your different income stream <laughs> and how I mean like I think for the audience it will be interesting you know especially during this recession period how they can build up additional stream of income so that they you know at least mentally they will not feel as a challenge or you know definitely will help them you know their mental fortitude lah that yeah. hey I don't need to liquidate my you know I mean I I oppose I don't need to liquidate my funds at the worst possible price and yeah. you know as the as the market start to drop. I mean, upflow is, we know it's cheap. Fundamentals are okay. If valuations are right or cheap, you know, at least I got extra bullets to uh, to add in. Yeah. yeah. So during this period, is there any like uh, aha moments or like struggles or, or perhaps like your, your biggest learnings uh, or mistakes yeah. uh, that you have that you can share with the audience so that the audience can, you know, perhaps uh, learn yeah. a bit from your, your footsteps? Yeah, I think so. There's two, right? Which is really a very... I'm very glad I'm because I'm 32 this year, even though, yeah, I mean, like earlier we mentioned, I crossed whatever number at 29, uh, but I mean, three years has passed. So I'm 32 this year, which is quite frankly, still a very young age. I think even for you, all, all of us right now, 30 is not yet 40. Um, So even for the people in the 40s, still a very young age to experience this, which I love it because at least I know that hey, this doesn't happen to me uh, nearing the end of my investing cycle because then that's a whole different um set of worries, right? Okay, so... I think let me just share two big lessons, which I'm trying to kind of, because I really didn't prepare for this, I'm trying to word it out properly. Number one, I realized that my style that allowed me to build the wealth was through pretty concentrated positions uh, in a lot of growth stocks. And so, of course, because of the nature of concentration in uh, in a bull run, right, uh, obviously everyone looks smart. And I would now looking back, you realize actually there's a lot of luck due to the multiple expansion as well, right? So this one, I don't doubt there was a lot of luck, a lot of just being the right place at the right time. So because of that, you realize that you the lessons you extract from success may not be the lessons that allow you to survive, which is why I'm also going through this drawdown quite painful. And so I think the biggest lesson I learned that, hey, the concentration style worked for me, but in a, in an environment like today, where let's say I still hold concentrated positions, uh, as I'm speaking now, not really anymore. I'll explain why later. Uh, I still, but before this, uh, before I did like a slight shift in my portfolio stance, uh, it was still pretty concentrated. And so I realized one problem when you're so concentrated, and every time a company, uh, one of the companies in your portfolio, maybe three companies in your portfolio whatsoever, they publish bad news. So I give an example, let's say Facebook. No, it's, it's, it's my holding, for example, right? So let's say if I hold Facebook. And Facebook actually, yeah, has a lot of free cash flow, you know, like uh, it's proven to have like a uh, great execution over the years from Mark Zuckerberg, from uh, the ex-COO, Sheryl Sandberg, whatever. So they're proven to be executing well. But hey, and then suddenly there's this whole worry about the metaverse starting to bleed them money. And then Sheryl Sandberg left. And then Mark Zuckerberg announces a very aggressive just cutting of the labor force. And then all these things you think about again, when you have such a heavy position, Right. Um, by the way, just in uh, full disclosure, I don't own Facebook. Uh. Just it's just an example. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. So you're such a heavy position, and then you see like all these news coming out. You know the typical investing. What's our uh, long term investor reaction is what? Oh, you know, don't ever let these news get to your head. Focus on the fundamentals. Yeah. Hey, but when a stock is 40 50 percent, that's the biggest lesson I learned, or maybe like thirty percent of your portfolio depends on how concentrated you are. Right. You will start to double think and ask yourself, hey, actually, does this news affect the fundamentals? Whereas for somebody with like a three percent, five percent position maybe even 10% position, they will be able to consider the news a lot more logically. So when you are a lot more concentrated, I realize the problem is that the news, you start to actually ask yourself, does this new news affect or not affect? And you're really legit trying to be logical, yeah. but your mind is also clouded already. Your judgment is actually affected. So that's one reason I realized that, you know what? I'm not Buffett. You know, everyone likes to say, oh, but Buffett says if you have uh, X dollars, you should be putting more money into the first stock than the than the seventh stock. They have more confidence. But hey, you know, <laughs> I'm not Buffett. I cannot think logically in this period. And I realized that, um, so I just give an upfront example. Let's say C was a company that I own in my portfolio. And what happens is when the news keep coming out, is it a good company? I think it is. It's a fantastic company. Hey, but one problem, <laughs> every week, I think back this, I think in the recent one or two weeks, maybe got a bit of dust settled down. But I think last month, every day got one report on eh? Garina, Shopee, cutting, 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 cutting. Even my own mother come and ask me because you know, I <laughs> why, hey, hey, your portfolio how? I heard the C Limited. I'm like, wow, piang, eh? So, you know, when that happens, right, you realize that shit, uh, these news, 
maybe in the long term really it doesn't matter. Eh. But mm. in this moment, it, it does affect the psychology eh, because it's a heavy right, position. Right. Yeah. So uh, a that real thing. Really, uh. yeah. Exactly. The downside of concentration, which is it does affect your psychology uh, and your ability to think in a very, very objective manner, especially in stress, stressful periods. So that's the first lesson. Second lesson is a bit related to this. If you go think about it, uh, why am I facing these issues? Like, so it's not just my mom, I think even some of my friends, even you, I think, texted me on one of the C after the earnings calls, the recent super tweet, yeah. earnings calls, which draws to my second lesson. And it's something that I really learned. Like, and I'm going to really be very, very strict about this moving forward for myself. And it is to really be super quiet about the stocks that I own. Right? So of course, I think for certain people, like let's say for you and for certain mentors that I know that have uh, have been very generous to teach me investing, you guys run investing courses and of course your own workshops that you teach and you maybe share about your stocks. Uh, but for me, I realized the thing is that like same thing, when you have a concentrated position, and even though for me, I've always had the stance where I don't talk about my stocks publicly, but to certain friends, I still say, right? But then, and so like, to certain friends, testing yourself included, which is what happened after, let's say, when C Limited release earnings or maybe another company release earnings that you own your portfolio. And then they're not, they're not there to, which I, I know generally you didn't mean to like call salt. It's just there to ask, hey, uh, what's your thoughts on this position? Because you yourself own it or somebody else also owns it. They want to understand your take. Yeah. So like, kind of exchange and bounce ideas because yeah, right. you want to know whether it's still a company worth holding. But okay. then when you have like three different people on three consecutive days asking you the same freaking question and same thing, this thing is also a major position in your portfolio. Then it causes you to also rethink because it causes cause you to reconsider, right? And I realized yeah. there's one downside also. Maybe if I'm as I'm explaining my justification for holding the stock or for dumping the stock, maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm right. But even if let's say I'm right and the more I explain this, I'm also pounding the idea in what? Then the question is, what if I'm wrong? You get my point. Like maybe as I'm trying to justify, like maybe like uh, example, one of the stocks uh, goes down and then or the earnings was super lousy. Let's say like C example. And then let's say you or you and another friend ask, hey, uh, what's your thesis for holding this? Just generally curious, wanted to understand more because I know you're into this industry. And then as I explain more, as I type, 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 hey, that thing is actually causing me to become more committed to the hand because I'm trying to explain and justify psychology. Right. Interesting. Right? Yeah. So, I think you can tell I come from a very marketing background, which you know. So I think about everything from a very psychological, uh, very, very mental point of view. So I can share with you, which this one uh, you didn't know until today. You know, like this was, I think, one, two months back after, you know, I think just a few days after C released earnings and then you texted me, what's, what's your take on that? And like, wow, yeah, yeah, I remember, yeah. I'm still holding because you know I'm like a big e-commerce bull. Uh, and so what happens was, I remember I typed you like this WhatsApp message because you asked me on WhatsApp. Yeah. And then I replied with a like freaking long essay of like the maybe a like, uh, few different logical substations. Why yeah. share with you something interesting? You know the the day after I texted you, the next I think it was, was on Sunday when I texted you. On Monday when the market yeah. opened, I cleared the position, <laughs> which is sounds very stupid. But I tell you my my realization as I was typing the message right. Then after I sent it to you, then I realized one problem. I like Max uh, in my own head uh, if it's a good position uh, you don't need to take one freaking essay to go and explain to Ray Ming or your friends why it's a good position. Ma. Like, you know, my most good, most good positions, like maybe for you, it's with Tesla. It's just like three to five bullet points, pump, 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 done. You don't need to go and explain, oh, because e commerce, the TAM is still big because probably in the, t- in the team has. Ex- I mean, yeah, maybe that's true, but you don't need to explain so much. Ma. So the fact that I'm explaining so much, even if let's say my points were correct, it just shows that I'm already biased already, but I didn't realize it. To me, it feels that I'm logical. Mm. So I was psychoanalyzing myself three, five layers deep and I didn't like that. And so uh, the next day when the market opened, I just trimmed the position. And I can tell you after I trimmed the position, the feeling was like, wow, you really feel super light. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, you just finished the exam and the kind of feeling. Kind of, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I'm actually pretty happy. And of course, thank God, um, over the years, um, I have managed to build a certain level of wealth from other consumer tech companies like Zoom over the years that I've managed to exit before this whole shit happened. So Zoom was exited last year in January. So it's very, very, very early. Uh, so thankfully, I'm uh, wealth-wise still okay, still very, very, very comfortable. But um, that's one lesson I, or two lessons I learned about concentration and talking too much about uh, stocks to your friends. Yeah. Right. I think that's very good uh, self-awareness uh, as an investor. You know, to yeah. be able to say, yeah, I mean, like, you know, maybe a bit biased already towards my own companies, you know, and then taking the actionable steps. I mean, definitely it's not easy to, you know, trim your position the next day. But I guess, you know, in your case, uh, it was necessary lah, to, to yeah. make you to, you know, clear the head and all that. So, uh, like, 
thanks for sharing this, you know, the story uh, regarding your- Never knew, right? Never knew, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then yeah. like, yeah, I, I actually, okay, but that's a story for another day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so because of that, right, what's your thoughts now on, you know, maybe now you're talking about a bit more concentration versus diversification. What is yeah. your risk management approach now, nowadays? Yeah. Like, uh, okay. we, we all realize that we are not Warren Buffett. And, yeah. Yeah. So to share, I think my approach from an outsider point of view will still be considered concentrated because I, I've expanded the positions from like maybe in the past was just like eight to nine stocks or six to seven. I think about that. I forgot the exact advice, about six to eight from to now. Maybe I'm, I'm aiming, like, I'm, I'm still building up the positions because right. Uh, as I liquidated that position, it was a mega <laughs> position, uh, right? Just to share uh, among a few others that I've also liquidated. Uh, and so what happens was uh, my new target is to build it up to like 15 to mm. or maybe 18 about there. I think to some people, this can actually still be considered concentrated because I know, you know, the Motley Fool way and all right, that, yeah. David Gardner, mm. it's like well, 40, 50 stocks, that kind. Uh, so I think this would still be considered concentrated. Uh, yeah, so it really depends on which definition. 18 companies, you mean? Yeah, 18, one eight. Yeah. Uh, so it's like quite a bit, quite a lot. Like, yeah, like, and, uh... yeah. I'm aiming, like, I'm aiming, I think I might fall short to maybe 15 or slightly below, given my personality where I like to focus and I like to see a very clean interactive focus account with very few tickers. Uh, so I might fall short, but probably at least 10, that's the aim uh, that I'm, I'm shooting for. That's number one. Do you have time to, you know, keep in touch with like 18 companies as we approach the yeah. seasons? And so maybe yeah. I think at this moment it's good to transit into, maybe you don't mind sharing a bit yeah. on your routines as a, you know, uh, okay. I'm sure right now you are busy with your side hustles and yeah. your other stuff. Uh, on the investing aspect, right? Like, uh, what what do you do on a day to day basis, or at least the time that you set aside? And I think I clarify that the eighteen is ideal. Uh. I haven't reached oh, the eighteen yeah. yet because I just liquidated like maybe two months back, right? So like what happens is which is around when we were texting, and so I'm still building up. Uh, just to right, right. Up front, I'm at like my my eighth position so far. Building, so I'm building up. But so you you may be right. Maybe by the time I hit ten or eleven, when the earnings season is gonna come soon, I'll be like, oh shit, man, I can't even breathe anymore. Like there's so many that maybe it might not be eighteen. But yeah, it that will definitely not be the previous like six or seven kind anymore. Right. Just a uh, bit more like at least. Yeah. For now, yeah, I get okay. it. Yeah, okay. but I will, I will still go for concentration. Yeah, so I think uh, because for me, I still believe that's how wealth is made. Like, I mean, you put like one percent into the next Tesla, or the next Netflix, it's not going to get you anywhere, right? Uh, okay. So I think to share the process, uh, my process is actually pretty fixed. I normally have like a three part process in general, though I don't execute them sequentially all the time. So generally, your process is how do I follow the company? Or your question is how do I follow the company? Is it or uh, or not? Um, or you can share that. Or also like curious into your routines uh you know what do you do on the investing and investing related okay. activities you know how much time do you spend okay on it, uh, you can. know what, what things you prioritize and all that okay can got it uh thanks so i think before that, i need to share the the information funnel first because that will uh yep. give a bit of context so for me, I don't spend that much time on a day-to-day basis, even though yeah, a lot of people look at me like, okay, yeah, I, I invest my own money full time. So kind of I, I no longer have I no longer have a nine to five job because I, I left uh end of last year. So it's like a full-time investor. But the truth is I think there's a lot of misconceptions. Like a full-time investor, I, I don't read annual reports every day in my bedroom, like Warren Buffett. So I still go about my day doing my own seminars, my own talks, my own side hustles. Uh so and the reason I can do that is because I already know the information sources. Uh, to give the context where I can get the information fast for the companies that I'm looking either to own, either I own, or I'm looking to still evaluate them further, like basically watch list kind of companies, right? right. For example, uh, for a lot of the growth companies that I, I, I own or I'm looking to own, uh, it's very easy to find the information, whether it's via Twitter with the, the hashtag, right, on certain sub stacks that I follow, certain subscriptions that I follow, certain Seeking Alpha subscriptions that I follow for the stock picker, right, mm. and then or Motley Fool. Right. right, so uh, I already roughly know my information sources, so that I don't have to go and commit too much time to that. And that's number one. Number two, normally before I like, I buy stocks or I take starter positions, which is like maybe three, four, two, three percent, uh, three, four percent about there. Uh, normally I already spend maybe like a few weeks to maybe uh, at least a month doing some base research on the company, whether it's really right. the annual report. Uh, I'll normally get the last 
eight to twelve quarters of the of the the quarterly earnings and the metrics, the revenue growth, cash flow, all the customer metrics, all the standard stuff. Uh, before I, I own the company, so uh, so all the work is done beforehand, ma. So after I buy the stocks, the only thing that I do is just to follow these different sources which I mentioned just now. You're seeking Alpha, Molly, Full, Substack, Twitter, and what have you. Uh, for any new sources of information that these people may surface and I may not be aware. Right. And then number two is actually just waiting for the earnings calls to come around. Uh, but normally after the earnings calls come around, on the next one to two days after the earnings call, I'll normally analyze the, the transcript and, and all that already. So even that is done beforehand. So on a day-to-day -day basis, let's talk about not earning season. Of course, earning season is a different ball game, I think. Right, you know, yeah. more, right? right. But uh non-earning season is like maybe daily about one hour just reading all these different updates and then if there's any new information as like example this company hired a new coo uh, a bit more bigger news or they have this tie up with amazon aws something like this uh, for the sales companies then you just read about it like okay cool just understand uh but really there's nothing much you need to actively keep doing uh because yeah, i think investing one thing that i I thought it was so damn good. Morgan Hauser actually said this thing. This guy is a, a genius for just dishing out one-liner wisdom. Very good articulating. Yeah. Wisdom. yeah. He said that the stock market doesn't care how hard you work, how much effort you put in, or the kager you need to achieve. I was like, hey, that's damn true. I mean, I heard of it about only like maybe like one year ago. It's like, you know, we all got this, oh, my internal IRR for my portfolio is 26%. It's uh, like 30%. My, my internal Kager. Yeah, I, uh, I want right? to achieve this, yeah. Yeah. And he said, the stock market doesn't give a damn. The stock market doesn't give... Uh, and then my time frame is for the next 10 years so that I can retire by the time I'm 45. <laughs> and now I'm 32. So the stock market doesn't give a damn what your retirement goals are, how much effort you put in, how much your Kager is. So my point is that uh, it's not to confuse activity and hard work for results. So yeah. So mm. I think that's my process. It's quite light. Earnings isn't a bit more effort into the earnings call and then studying these additional forums and sources uh to see uh any other different takes from other people. Yeah. Do, do you pay any attention to like, you know, uh the macros, economy, the news, inflation, reset like how is the uh, like Yeah. I, I don't actively research it, uh, but I do pay attention to read from the articles and the sources that are read. So for example, one source is uh, Reming's amazing Telegram group where he has his own macro takes. And of course, there's other uh, local investors, other international investors on forums or articles uh, where I, I'm kind of following them or I'm subscribed to it. And then uh, or I'm in a membership and just like listen to it. You know? Yeah, so I don't diss it out like, oh, screw the macro, man. Like, no, no, I, I still listen. I, I absorb it in. Uh, yeah, so maybe and that's... that, you know gel into your synergize into your investing approach do they affect your you know uh or right now like for example macro fears recession inflation still high uh you know maybe yeah. not although valuation is right might not be time to buy or how do you like compartmentalize this yeah. so i will share so to be fair i really don't know whether it's helpful or not okay <laughs> because we already know looking <laughs> back like maybe one out. year from now we look back and we oh actually it was helpful or actually it was just BS, you know, didn't really matter. Um I think for me is that uh, I don't really use it to make my specific investing decisions for the specific stocks. Mm. Right. Like example, oh yeah, the macro uh right now is uh example not good. So I'm gonna be more focused on maybe cybersecurity. So so no, I, I don't really do that. I still focus on the company, each specific of them, how's the how the growth rate doing at this juncture. So I don't just use on that that, that side. Because I know some investors are yeah, periods like this, you shouldn't be in consumer discretionary e-commerce or whatever. Mm. No, should be like so you don't like uh, oh, because right now it should be more defensive, certain industry I favor more, but rather you go from a bottom up approach. Yeah. If yeah, the company correct. is good, then it's good. Like, if it's not, correct. then I don't care you what industry, I'm not going to invest in you. Yeah, yeah, because my take is the same thing. I know this is going to piss the macro people off. Is that at the end of the day, you macro, not macro. The numbers in the company's results quarter to quarter will speak for itself. What? Right? You can right. say, hey, circular trend doing very well, true. But you look at CrowdStrike's recent, <laughs> recent earnings. I mean, it's still decent, by the way. 50% like they're growing at a... Yeah. All right, but you, look, you listen to the earnings calls and everything. It's still very, they're also saying that they are seeing an elongation in the sales cycle of certain mm -hmm. stuff. Same thing for Zscaler as well. So so uh, my take is macro, not macro, you still have to look at the individual companies. I think that's how I like to sleep well at night. That makes me feel better. But it did affect my portfolio allocation. So what I mean is that because now, I have a bit more cash to deploy, which is maybe why you see I'm smiling more because I feel like no cash, right? So after you trim or you exit the more concentrated positions, I have a lot more cash. 
So uh, because as, uh, my plan was initially to deploy, let's say the cash over like maybe uh, six months or maybe seven months, example. Right. And then you hear the macro, you see things, and then it kind of gets a bit to your mind also. I'll be upfront, like, I'm not like, like some awesome. scene where like totally like, like, uh, like I would say immune to it. Then you see like, hey, Oh, Jerome Powell, like them hockey, I say he's gonna do whatever it takes to bring down inflation. That was just last week or two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. So because of that, I'm like, okay, you know what? Let me just uh increase my duration to add into the market from seven months. Maybe I do it across ten months, lah. So so my per month to add becomes lesser. So that did affect it. And same thing, people will maybe swan me and say, oh, Max, you're letting macro get to your head. Yeah, I'm human, <laughs> so I'm letting it get to my head, and I I don't know how to stop it. <laughs> so uh, but I, I can only react based on all these. But uh, that affected my. Uh, allocation or my time to allocation but it doesn't affect my choice of company which I think that one is very crucial right, right, right. Uh, for me that one is yes, not there's nothing wrong with it I mean like the best plan is the plan that allows you to sleep at night uh, right yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, stretching your DCA across a longer period uh, decreasing the amount each month or each entry I think it's perfectly fine I think it's yeah. a very valuable tip for you know uh, the audience who are watching it right now you know how, how to remain sane I think stretching out your dollar cost averaging lowering the amount to make you feel a bit more comfortable. I think that's perfectly fine. So yeah. if I just want to rehash back to earlier, you know, you're talking about uh, diversifying to a bit more companies. Uh, do you also diversify to other asset classes? If you don't mind talking a, a bit mm. about this, like yeah. uh, maybe you're talking about stock market, but what's your views on, you know, like the perhaps other, other asset classes like properties? Uh, and then of course we got like crypto and then your yeah. traditional like gold, silver, like metals. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. Uh, just that I'm not very well versed, so I don't. Uh, but I am starting to study them. Uh, but I can share with you. I actually see a lot of wisdom in that. Like example, this period, right? When I look at the property investors, uh, I'm like, oh, oh my goodness, these guys are so zen. Like, you know, the, the property price won't crash fifty percent in one day, right? Yeah, yeah, and then you think about cash flow every month, eh? so I'm like, you know, before this, doing the full run, like, well, all these property guys, yeah, okay, like. <laughs> So slow, everything. Look at us, right? <laughs> <laughs> Kings. Yeah. And then now you look at them, like okay, there is some wisdom in that. So I think the lesson I'm realizing in this period is that actually there's a lot of wisdom to having a slightly more uh broad based diversified portfolio. So uh, I actually am a big fan of property. Just that I don't think it's going to be my cup of tea because I really like studying companies, business models, seeing how this CEO one up the other CEO, how they kind of find a way to enter the market. I mm. I just think strategy is very interesting to me. And then you learn about a lot about leadership, a lot about people as well. Whereas I think from property, uh, I could be wrong, but uh, you're just learning about maybe the land, the location, up and coming development. So uh, it doesn't bring as much kick to me. So what I see value there, I'll just be the first to admit, uh, it may just be uh, lip service because I might not do anything, but I do see value and uh, I'm reading more about it, but I haven't taken any action. And I don't think I'll take any action anytime soon. As for your thoughts on crypto, uh, actually, I think there's... Uh, I think there's a lot of merit uh, to put a small portion to crypto. So before that, as an investor, I was just like, hey, you know what? And even though now it's the crypto winter, which crypto may be really out of fashion. And before this, as an investor, I was very typical, very buffered. Uh, you know, like manga and buffer is just like keep swanning crypto. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's uh, useless. It's, it's, it's very, it's a, it's a shitty thing for society and everything, the way manga says it. But then I realized that, hey, like true, uh, I mean, you, it, it may not have any productive value or whatever. Hey, but the truth is, hey, you can talk about all these theory and not having any productive value. But if you happen to put a small amount inside and that thing takes off 1,000 times to the moon, we call it mooning or you guys call it mooning, right? I might not have any credit for my hard work for getting that 1,000%, but I still get the luck, right? So you got me thinking, maybe I should put a small portion inside. And so yeah, I did take out a tiny, 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 tiny portion of my, of my investable wealth. And I put it, uh, I'm not going to say what, uh, because I really do, don't do any studies of the white papers. And I think most white papers are shit anyway. <laughs> it's just for fun, just to kind of play a bit of speculation uh, to certain coins that have images of dogs. So I won't share too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, with uh, images of uh, cute, <laughs> cute Japanese dogs. Quite obvious. Yeah, yeah, but I think it makes sense uh, from, uh, you know, like barbell strategy or like, you know, you have a hedge against the the collapse of governments or like traditional currencies yeah. so yeah if like for example one percent and then if it doesn't take off then so be like it's just one percent but if it does take off then yeah you just go 1000x or what then it's fine also so i guess that's exactly. that approach uh that approach 
kind of worked quite well. So, so it's, it's really pure speculation. So I'll just be the first to admit. Hey, man, yeah. you're an investor, you're speculating. Yeah, man, fuck, I'm speculating man, because if it does go whatever result, hey, I want to at least know that, hey, I got the wealth, but then you got lucky. Oh, fine, I got lucky. But yeah, it's, I got lucky. Right? Yeah. Yeah, man. Hey, Max, so uh, I think we have, I think we can cover a lot and thanks so much for, you know, sharing yeah. candidly, you know, with our audience today. And, you know, just before we go, one minute, last, one last question for you. Lah. What, what is happiness to you? You know, like a non-investing, you know, topic, yeah. but perhaps a more, a bit like a philosophical, but maybe a general, you know, question that, you know, outside of money, lah, what is yeah. happiness to you? Yeah. Uh, and so I really got to, I think I can share my perspective. Uh, I really got to answer this question uh, through my own life for the last uh, nine, ten months after I left my full-time nine-to-five job. Oh, uh, because nice. then I really have quite a lot of freedom and time. And I realized that the thing that brings me a lot of happiness still today, uh, like, you know, most people after you quit your job, you're thinking maybe you can, you want to go to the beach, do nothing, that will bring you happiness. So you try all those things, but most of this happiness, or you can go travel the world, it will wear out after a while. You will start to get very, very sick and very used to it. Yeah, but there's still one thing that even ten months in, and I think this will likely still bring me a lot of happiness maybe even 10 years in, and that is the ability, which is same thing, uh, back to Morgan Hauser, this guy is such a genius. The ability to wake up what time I want, <laughs> to eat lunch what time I want, and to have pretty much full control on most days, mm. uh, because some days you've got errands to run, but most right. days, how the hell you want to plan your schedule. I can tell you, even 10 months in today, and yeah, it's been only 10 months, but I am still damn happy whenever I wake up, I'm like, oh, it's actually 10 a.m. Oh my goodness, it's so late. Shit, I'm not an early bird, but hey, I feel really good. And then you can eat the Thai fun at the coffee shop, take your time, eat one half hour, watch people go by, and then just listen to a podcast. Like that kind of pleasure is, is sick. I can tell you, it's such a nice feeling. So Morgan Hauser, I think he said it very well in, the, in much more, more professional than me in the sense where uh, the highest dividend that money or wealth can buy you is the ability to control your time. And I think that is really a feeling that will never wear off because it's just very, very short to be able to pick not just what time you want to wake up, but how you want to allocate your schedule and stuff. And for me, uh, I think to go in a bit deeper on that, one priority of mine today, uh, which I did share with some of my students in, in the side hustle course, which I think you were there also, is I want to be able to eat dinner with my mom uh, mm. at least four or five times a week. Uh, so to maybe explain why, it's because I was a speaker and trainer from the speaking seminar industry, which I think a lot of you guys would know so on yourself. Uh, a lot of seminars happen at night on the weekends and I used to be very proud of that. Uh, can you imagine? It's very silly. But I used to be very proud. Oh, yeah, I'm always busy. I'm working, I'm hustling, I'm doing speaking, training. I got no time for my for my family, for my friends because I'm busy because, you know, busyness makes you feel important. And so I wore that that busyness as a badge of honor. Like, yeah, I'm always busy. You cool, man. Look at me. I'm going places. But I realized, shit, man, I'm the only child to be, to share with the audience. I'm the only child. My, par- my, my, my parents or my folks, my mom's not getting any younger. So I realized that that was so stupid. So in a way, I'm just basically trying to use the wealth I've been very lucky to accumulate through God's blessing or whatever uh, to buy back the time I have my mom. So everything I centralize is prioritized around having dinner with my mom at night. And because of that, uh, I try to work my lifestyle around having dinner at night with my mom. And so that's how the control of the schedule gives me a lot of happiness. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing that, Max. Yeah, I yeah. think having like, you know, time control uh, in our lives, I think that's really good. Like, you know, uh, don't have to wake up to an alarm clock, that kind of feeling. And then it yeah. you your life. <laughs> yes. That's something that, yeah. I'm sure the audience, most of you will, will be able to resonate with it and, you know, uh, perhaps can work your way towards it. Lah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, as we wrap up, right, hey, Max, before we end off, right, where can, if any of the audience would like to know more about you, find out more about your tweets and all that, where can they find you? Yeah, so uh, I always like to say I don't work in any fund, even though I'm very into investing. I don't own a fund, I think. So I don't have any uh, places where you can find me physically. Uh, you want digitally two main places, which is number one, Instagram, and number two, uh, Twitter. So I tweet a lot of my investing thoughts uh, and my ideas on Twitter. Uh, Instagram is more for like personal, all the random shit that I do and the random type of... What, what type of you eat, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but the handle is the same for both. It's hey, Max Cole. So H-E-Y... M-A-X-Q-H, more than happy to connect as long as you're not weird or any psycho. More than happy to chat and nerd out about investing. So yeah, that's where you can find me and always, always very happy to chat about just personal growth, books, uh, which I'm a big nerd for and investing. Yeah. All right, man. Hey guys, to add Max Cole, uh, hey Max Cole, if you haven't, I think he articulate uh, really good stuff on Fintuit. And if you want to take a look at what Chai Fan, you know, he has been always eating, right? Follow him on Instagram. Yeah. 
All right. To give cool. a like and uh, subscribe in below. All right. And yeah, any subscribe. other questions that you have for us or what you want to see for the next podcast, right? To add in the comments below. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed this session. All right. See you guys. Bye bye. Thank you, Raining. Bye bye. Thank you.